the nine stages of getting rich. So according to a 2019 study by WealthX, almost 70% of the world's richest people, meaning those with a net worth of $30 million or more, are self-made, meaning they created their wealth all on their own rather than inheriting it from their parents or relatives or a trust fund or anything like that. If we're just talking about millionaires in general, meaning people with a net worth of a million dollars plus, the percentage of those that are self-made increases tremendously to a staggering 88%, meaning almost nine out of 10 millionaires became millionaires on their own. Which begs the question, at least in my mind, if the vast majority of the rich and ultra rich got there by themselves, how'd they do it? Well, Bernie and I aren't millionaires quite yet, but just from the past eight years of our financial journey combined with talking to and observing the few millionaires we do know, there seem to be very distinct stages on the way to accumulating wealth. They don't all take the same amount of time and not everybody may start at stage one and there may be some overlap between some of these things, but these are the stages that Bernie and I have noticed at least in our lives and the lives of the wealthy. Stage one we're calling distracted because in this stage, the mental focus is mainly on what's around you instead of managing your money. Typically in this stage, there's not much critical thought when it comes to spending, spending habits. There's a lot more value placed on spending money than there is saving it. When we were in this stage, if we saw something we wanted, we usually purchased it. And for bigger items, we tended to put it on credit and then just pay it off little by little over time. So we feel like in this stage, People see consumer debt as more or less of a normal part of life, something that's unavoidable. And therefore they're, they're more likely to accumulate consumer debt. So whether that be student loans, car payments, credit card debt, things like that. Brittany and I had all of those. And the primary focus of your work is just to work enough to pay the bills. And this is something we did too, where we were living paycheck to paycheck. You also think income taxes are a normal part of life and there's not much thought beyond that. Even though you really dislike them. Yeah. So in the distracted stage, Brody and I didn't recognize the long-term problems we were getting ourselves into with all of this consumer debt accumulation. Because we were getting ourselves so much into debt, over time, we were able to save less and less of our income and more and more of our income was going out in payments every month, which leads us into the second stage we're calling the Great Financial Awakening <laughs> Part 1. We're naming that because in this stage, you realize there's something wrong. And that's exactly what happened to Brittany and I. Yeah. The event that kicked this off for us was going to a Dave Ramsey seminar that was four hours long on a Sunday evening. We quickly realized the way we were handling money before wasn't the right way to go. You realize that following the popular consumer-driven societal lines of thinking when it comes to money is actually ruining your financial future rather than creating a, a, a good financial future for you. While you might be looking rich at the time, right. you're not actually rich. You also realize that consumer debt is a terrible thing because it chips away at your largest wealth building tool in these first initial stages, and that is your income. The more consumer debt you have, the more payments you're making every month out to banks and whatnot, and the less of your income you get to keep. And you're beginning to notice the cycle that keeps occurring, which a lot of people refer to as the rat race. And it's basically where you go to work, trade your time for money, and then you go and buy more items, and you accumulate more debt and then realize you can't keep up with your debt payments, so you need a better paying job. And then once you get that better paying job or raise, you start spending it again on more debt. And the cycle just keeps continuing and continuing. So because of all this, you realize that you need to rework how you think about money. Which leads us to stage three, which is digging yourself out of the hole. Yep, so in this stage, you're basically trying to undo the mess that you got yourself into in the first stage. All the consumer debt that you accumulated anything else you're trying to to undo that so if you're familiar with dave ramsey if you're following the baby steps this would pre, this would kind of coincide with baby step two where you're just paying everything off smallest to largest except the house you're living way below your means you're cutting out all unnecessary expenses you're probably budgeting by now so you can kind of follow a monthly plan of spending to just just so you can make sure that you're spending money only on things you need to. During this stage, you may be getting a, a second or third job to raise your income, to help pay things off faster. At least in Brittany's in my case, that's what we did. We had like five or six jobs in between the yeah. two of us when we were paying off all of our debt. We did a lot. In this stage, you're also valuing saving money over spending it more and more. Whereas in stage one, you valued spending money over saving it. Now you're valuing saving it and paying everything off more than you are spending it. Your financial view is still small, but you're starting to see and realize that by digging yourself out of this hole, you're starting to prepare and build a better financial future. Stage four is consumer debt-free. So you're totally 100% debt-free, except for maybe a house if you have one. So you still have a mortgage, but everything else is paid off. No student loans, no car payments, no credit cards, no nothing. In this stage, you're catching your breath a little bit from, from the previous stage. 
You're working to pay for necessities, things you need. And now that you're debt free, you're understanding that this is a better way to live and it's something you should have done to begin with. Your spending habits shift from a consumer driven mindset to more of a following the budget type of mindset. Yeah. You're able to give to charities more because now all your needs are met and you feel like you can give to others a lot more. You also realize in this stage that while it is very nice being debt free, if a big financial emergency happens, you're going to be unprepared because you don't have an emergency fund. Which is a great segue into stage number five, which we're calling emergency funded. And this is where you have anywhere from three to six months worth of expenses all the way up to 12 months worth of expenses covered. So in this stage, you feel the most financial peace and security you've ever felt in your life up to this point. You're still working to pay for necessities and things like that, but you're probably taking more time off, taking more mini vacations and things like that. You're budgeting for items that you want to purchase rather than just impulsively spending money on them like you would have been in stage one. Because your immediate future up to a year from now is funded and taken care of, your financial field of view broadens to even more areas that are outside of your immediate life. It's also in this stage that you begin to see a new problem develop, or, or at least you're able to see a new problem that you haven't seen before. And that is still kind of being stuck in the rat race, which leads us to stage six, what we're calling the Great Financial Awakening Part Two. So you're debt free, you have a, a sizable emergency fund in place. However, you still have to go to work every day and you're still probably trading your time for money. Yep. And as long as you're trading your time for money, you will always have to work. It's in this stage, the Great Financial Awakening Part Two, where you realize you may not want to work your entire life. You may just want to be able to sleep and make money while you sleep, like Warren Buffett has famously said. In this stage, you're also fed up with seeing between 25 and 50% of your income being paid out to the government every month. Because what this means is that you're basically working between 65 and 130 days a year for the government for free. So for example, over the past two years, Bernie and I have calculated how much money we paid in taxes. It was about $50,000 over the past two years. I cannot tell you how many things we could have used that money for. Yep. Like I could have hired somebody to help me with my business. Mm -hmm. We could have bought more furniture. There's a million things we could have done with that money. You're also realizing that time's your most valuable asset and it's something that's irreplaceable. You can always make more money, but you can't make more time. You also realize that because you're working a job and you're trading your time for money, there is a cap on how much money you can make every year. Even if that cap is hundreds of thousands of dollars, there's always going to be a cap to it because there's only so many hours in a day that you can work. Because of this, the idea of passive income maybe starts coming to your mind. You start researching ways to make passive income. If you're not familiar with passive income, it's basically like you're, you're working really hard for something that you can just put out there in the market that will pay you for the rest of your life or for a very prolonged period of time after it's out there. Also, there's a shift in your mindset from wanting to spend money on luxuries to building passive income to then pay for those luxuries. You also realize that an understanding of tax law is going to be imperative if you want to learn how to keep more of your, the money that you make every year. You realize more and more that not all income is created equally. Also, not all debt is created equally. You're also starting to see that there is a big difference between how the wealthy, the rich people handle their money and how the middle class and the poor handle their money. Next is stage number seven, which is the pursuit of permanent freedom. And this is getting out of the rat race for good. You're using your regular income to build passive income sources. You're learning tax laws and ways you can legally avoid paying taxes on your income. You're also learning different ways you can make income that are more tax advantaged. You may be researching real estate. You could be buying up real estate as, as the, like investment properties. You could try to be building a business that's going to scale without you necessarily having to scale the amount of hours you work in it. You could be investing in dividend paying stocks, which are basically stocks that pay you monthly or quarterly. Writing a book is another good example of a way to earn passive income. You spend a lot of time working on it at the beginning, but once it's out there and published, you earn money from it for the rest of your life. You could be starting a YouTube channel, which is a great way to earn passive income once you're monetized. Once the video is out there, it just earns money for you for at least as long as YouTube's around. You could also be maybe looking at startup, startup companies if you don't want a, like an immediate return on your money. In this stage, you're valuing your time exponentially more than you value your money. You value your time so much that you may even be paying other people to do simple tasks for you like getting the groceries, cooking, mowing the lawn, things like that. So you can spend all of your extra time educating yourself when it comes to personal finance and learning how to build passive income sources and spending your time actually building those passive income sources. Because you, you understand that the more time you can spend doing that right now, the more it's probably gonna pay off in the future. This is actually where Brittany and I are right now. We're in between stage seven and stage eight. We're researching a lot about real estate. We're researching 
how to invest in startups. We're just researching all sorts of stuff. And we currently already have some sources of passive income working for us. Which leads us into stage eight, and that's what we're calling semi-financially free. And that's when your passive income is enough to meet your basic monthly expenses. Once this happens, technically you don't have to work anymore if you don't want to. So you could basically live off of this forever as long as your cost of living and all of your expenses stayed the same. I feel like most people who are at this stage continue to work because at, at this stage in the game, like the passive income probably amounts to 25, 30, maybe $35,000 a year, which is, like we said, enough to cover the basic monthly expenses, but it's, it's nothing that's gonna give you a lifestyle that you're more than likely gonna enjoy, at least in America. Mm. So what you're doing now is you're using most or all of your regular income to fund building passive income sources, investments, assets, things like that. Your passive income may be paying for your regular monthly expenses. And this leads us to our ninth and final stage, which is you're financially free, or another way of saying it is you're rich. Basically, you're completely free and your money is doing all the work for you. Your excess investment income and income from the assets that you've purchased is enough to pay your monthly expenses, to fund the things that you want to buy, all your luxuries and things like that on top of your monthly expenses, and it's enough to buy more assets and investments. In this stage, you really don't have to work anymore if you don't want to. What Bree and I have noticed, at least in terms of the millionaires that we, that we do know, the, the wealthy people that we know, those of them who are in this stage, they're still working. And they're, they're working because what they're doing is in no way related to having like a typical nine to five job. It's, it's, they're working in the, a business they've created themselves and they legitimately enjoy what they're doing. It, yeah. it doesn't feel like work to them. They love what they do. Something else that we've noticed about people in this stage is that they generally have a legal team of lawyers and CPAs and people like that to help them analyze potential deals and make sure they're getting the biggest and most tax advantages as they can potentially get. And the best return on their investment. Other than that, this stage is, is pretty much all about leaving a legacy. Like, how do you want to shape the world? What is the dent that you want to put in the universe, as Steve Jobs once said. So nine stages. On the surface, that seems like a lot to go through. How can you fast track your way through these if you want to, if you don't want to start at stage one? What Bernie and I have noticed is that the, the two biggest financial turning points in our lives had to do with learning some way to think about money that we were ignorant to before that. Yeah. It all has to do with basically financial education is how Robert Kiyosaki coins it. How well educated you are about how money works, how investments work, Basically, just how, how life works when it comes to money. I mean, you, you could easily just skip to stage seven of all this if you stayed consumer debt free, if you understood that having credit card debt and student loans and car loans, having all that stuff pile up monthly just isn't healthy for you financially. It all has to do with financial knowledge and how you put that knowledge into practice in your own life. Some great resources for gaining more financial knowledge are books, YouTube videos, and reaching out to others who are ahead of you financially. So if you know someone who's wealthy, asking them how they got there. So with all that being said, which stage do you guys feel that you're at? Like, like Brittany and I said, we feel like we're kind of in between stages seven and eight right now. Mm -hmm. Hoping to get to nine within the next <laughs> few years, three yeah. to five, six years maybe. But yeah, we'd be curious to know in the comments which stage you guys feel that you're at. You guys, thanks so much for watching. We appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a huge thumbs up. It helps out tremendously with the YouTube algorithm. Consider subscribing or browsing our channel if you like videos like this. We've got a lot more finance videos. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at It's Mike and Britt. Yep, we post there every now and then. If you're at the very beginning of all this and may need some help setting up a monthly budget and how to like kind of plan your, your monthly spending, our budget template is linked below. That's the, the outline of basically how Brittany and I budget on a monthly basis. It's totally free, no email address required. If you're curious about the investing world, maybe you want to start off doing some investing, our Robinhood link is also in the description. If you sign up to Robinhood using that link, you get a free stock and we get a free stock. It helps out everybody. And with that being said, thanks so much again for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. The first stage we're calling distracted. The more consumer debt you have, the larger monthly payments you have, which means the less of your income you can keep. And that was that was the problem. I'm looking at it. Huh?